Hey everyone, welcome back to the Commercial Real Estate Library podcast. I'm Dama Tamanawala. You know my co-host Garrett McGillivray. And today we are joined by a very special guest. He is the CEO of Main Street Equities, Bob Dylan. Bob, thanks for being with us. Thank you. This is a great honor to be with you guys. It's not every day that I get Bay Street guys like you who want to interview Western Canadian entrepreneurs. I I I find that hard to believe, especially uh, like you guys have abandoned us in Alberta. Like you don't, as if we don't exist. You're like I'm your step brother that you don't want to even return calls to. Right. But can I prove that point to you? Why is Main Street trading at a significantly lower multiple than the Ontario guys, Ontario multifamily guys? You have abandoned us. It's about time you guys give us some. Uh, love and affection. There's no point giving us love and affection when the oil is back at a hundred bucks, then it'll be too late. Right. Okay. So if you're listening to this podcast, go out and buy Main yeah. Street right now. Uh, Bob, wh why, don't, why don't... First of all, I never promote the Main Street stock. Okay. Let's be very clear. <laughs> Promotion has got a direct correlation with cannabis and Bitcoin and all this pump and dump. If you want to invest in a bulletproof business, Main Street is a great story. Or oh, limited down, limited downside risk because of the asset class we traded. Fair enough. I don't mind uh, the cryptocurrency stuff, as as Garrett knows. But nonetheless, uh, Bob, can you share a little bit about Main Street and? You know why? Why should people be talking about your company? What for the for the few people who don't know about your company? What's what's going on there? I think a lot of people don't know about my company, but my company is it's not about me or Main Street. It's about the uniqueness of the asset class called multifamily, which is apartment buildings. And Garrett has probably done billions of dollars with the lending in the multifamily sector. Now, you know, what's unique about multifamily is, and it's pr proven so during, uh, proven due to, uh, it was proven during this pandemic. One, the multifamily trades below replacement costs, generally speaking. It doesn't matter if it's Prince Edward Island or Comox, BC. If you, if you bought an apartment building, if you build an apartment building, it's going to cost you more to build than mine existing. That's one. That's a very unique, uh, un very unique aspect of multifamily that people don't generally talk about. That's the number one thing everybody should be talking about on apartment buildings. As you run the apartment building sector in Colliers, I don't know if you ever discussed this with clients. Hey, you realize it is yeah. two percent of replacement costs. But that's before the number prices have gone up year over year, 100%, and go through an inflationary cycle. You talk about cap rates, and you talk about this, and you talk about demand, uh, but you don't talk about the most important thing is replacement costs. I think that's number one. Number two is a future, uh, future um, trend line. Everybody's looking for what the trend line is. The trend line on apartment buildings, as you know, 2.2 million apartments purpose built. I realize condos go into the space as well. Purpose built apartments, while the population growth on immigrants alone in the next three years is going to be 1.2 million. So total supply 2.2, let's say a vacancy rate of 200,000 units and 1.2 million uh, immigrants coming. Just like your dad and my dad, we were both all immigrants who came to Canada. Um, and um, low replacement cost and demand supply anomaly. Now that's before foreign students. 2019 census, I think said 756,000 foreign students. Now if I was a betting guy, most of my renters, right? So we hit them close to 2 million demand and supply at 2.2 million. Then blow replacement cost. Now the biggest driver that nobody talks about, like I'm gonna pause on the, uh, my biggest driver and talk about why I'm focused on this narrow niche called mid-market apartment buildings. All your other clients, Garrett's clients and your clients are probably REIT guys, or, you know, building these new buildings and they're chasing a certain segment of the market, which is 20%. My segment of the market is 80%, which is the smaller buildings. My second part of my segment is Western Canada, Winnipeg West. 
And third is my average rent is below $1,000. Why is that important? Because 73% of Canadians make less than $50,000 a year. Mm. You guys are chasing Ferrari dealerships. I'm chasing all the other dealerships in Canada, you know. Uh, so the market is 73% of Canadians make less than $50,000 a year. I realize as a husband and wife work, uh, you know, combine into mm -hmm. higher and, and lots of things. I know there's a lot of variables, but the macro numbers are so big. Supply, demand, anomaly, and um, low replacement costs. And the, unless the incomes go up, the double in the Canadian household, I think uh, it is a pretty safe, all apartment building players across Canada are, uh, it's a safe investment. Now, how I differ from your other clients is we are the only non-REIT. That means we are we take our cash flow, buy more buildings, we fix our buildings up. Generally, we buy buildings that are in distress. Right. So the day we buy, we increase increase our top line revenue. So uh, by fixing them up and a little bit of uh, everything is internalized. So proper management, management, add value, what we call main street value chain. And again, one of the uh, competitive advantage we have, not main street. Uh, the market is Western Canada, mid-market add value, this limited players. Mm. Ontario, which has multi-generation of wealth, uh, first of all, I think it's got so much wealth that it's chasing two little deals, and that's why your cap rates are so low. Western Canada is opposite. You have less supply. Um, one, we have less supply per population to their newer cities, better landlord tenancy acts that favor the landlord, right? And and limited multi-generational wealth. So less capital chasing deals. That's why cap rates are higher and, and our yields are higher and we get better deal, better deals price per pound. Right. Unless you believe, unless you believe a dollar earned in Alberta is worth half as much as a dollar earned in Ontario. If you believe in that, then I guess my theory is out. <laughs> I, first of all, we thank you for that, Bob. We are on the same team. It feels like it feels like you're out to get the Ontario guy, um, but we're on the same multi-family team. Please, I love Ontario. You know what I say? Please keep su suppressing your cap rates. Now bring it down to zero. I'm trying. If you <laughs> take your cap rates down to zero, my cap rates will start going down. And uh, that means the net asset value of Main Street will continue to go up. I think you should aim for zero cap rate. But that is always my goal. Um, by, <laughs> by the way, uh, Bob, so so to the end result, because we were talking about the, the, the different reasons why multifamily in, in Western Canada is such a great investment class. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about Main Street and where you guys are at in terms of you know total uh, units that you guys operate kind of the size of the company you're running? Sure. Do you want to start? You want me to start with my personal journey? Yes. Yes, 100%. So um, I was born in Japan. My father was born in Hong Kong. And my parents from both sides of my family, my dad and my mom, are both Sikh, Sikhs from the state of Punjab, where I think there's approximately a million Sikh immigrants in Canada that nobody talks about. Um, and uh, they were, my dad was, my dad, my grandparents, and my great grandfather, they were all traders in the Pacific Rim, uh, Pacific Rim region. My father was in like unfortunate time when he was in Liberia, West Africa, when the civil war broke out and we came as economic refugees to Canada. No money, nothing. And Canada's been a great country for all immigrants, uh, like your dad and my parents. and. And they chose the right country at the right time, and we are blessed to be here. It's the greatest country in the world. The only people who complain about Canada are Canadians. But the, if you're a worker like I am, I'm a little bit of a culture buff. And the more I travel, I say, what a great country. I can't wait till I come back home. Now, the winter is sometimes a little harsh for somebody who doesn't enjoy winter. Uh, winters. <laughs> Canada is 
great country. So I, I came to Canada at a very young age and did, did all my schooling and we, you know, start up immigrant family with humble beginnings. Which part of Canada, by the way? Oh, our first port of entry was Vancouver. Okay. And, and my parents, we were kids, we migrated to Calgary and, um, you know, no real jobs. I started flipping houses when I was 19 and I was fortunate enough to got, got to know this mess lender. That's what you call them nowadays as mess lenders. And those days they used to call them equity lenders, which basically took big risks on the equity. And, um, and I had the opportunity to buy my first two homes with a partner and I made like 18,000 bucks. I don't remember exactly. I think it was like 17, 18,000 dollars. And that was all the money in the world. Imagine if you're starting out at 19 today and inflationally in, uh, adjusted uh, check you get from the lawyers is like a million bucks. It's probably not that high, but it got a big return and that changed my life. Uh, what changed my life was the opportunity Alberta gave us um, because it was a little bit of an open shop. It wasn't a multi, multi-generational wealth. There was a lot of foreclosures and in the uh, you know early 90s, uh, lots of foreclosures and you know the lenders were receptive, the uh, vendors were receptive, everybody was receptive for somebody who wanted to just raise your hand up and say, yeah, I'm going to buy a couple of houses and fix them up. They were all boarded up anyway. Uh, you, you, it's hard to imagine that, but that's what the crisis Alberta was going through. And so that's how I started out and I kept doubling down. And today, Main Street has got 14,200 apartment units, which is two, roughly 2.2 billion in assets. Our FFO number annualized Q1, I think is going to be $4.85. But our claim to fame has been, uh, when we started Main Street, we had 8.8 million shares or 8.9 million shares outstanding. outstanding. And today we got 9.4 million shares outstanding, but the 272 units, which was my personal portfolio, has grown from 17 million to uh, 2.3 billion on a testament to a business model. And what, what is a business model? Is adding value. So we are not financial engineers, and I wish I was, but I'm not a financial engineer. What I am is I'm a creator of value, and I'm a creator of improving lives of middle-class Canadians. So we take these buildings, which are in very rough shape, and we spend money, renovate them, and we increase the top-line revenue by sometimes as low as 15 20% to as high as 40%. But it takes a while, and it takes a long time to uh, stabilize these buildings. But we are fortunate that we are in a land environment of landlord tenancy act, which is a lot more favorable to the vendor uh, than they are like in Ontario. Mm. Uh, our asset base is Winnipeg West, uh, Winnipeg, Calgary, Edmonton, Saskatoon, Regina, Vancouver, Laura Mainland, we have a very significant footprint in Surrey, which is a suburb of Vancouver, Surrey, Abbotsford, Chilliwack, Vernon, um, Kamloops, uh, Penticton. So uh, not only we are in the big hubs of Vancouver, but we are in the secondary centers um, of British Columbia. Our biggest platform is uh, in um, Edmonton uh, Ice District. And uh, if you want, I'll get up and I'll show you how we've consolidated the inner city of Edmonton. You want me to show you the plot? Or no? Okay. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see it. Okay. There's, so, there's so much going on. And so, and for our audience who doesn't know, uh, I, I'm. <laughs> okay. Wow. If you look at, that is. Ima imagine owning your will. And this is a bigger area than New Yorkville, but just imagine this. But you cannot own New Yorkville today, but you could. Could have been 40, 50 years ago. So downtown Edmonton, called the Ice District, was going through a transformation. Transformation um, is new LRT lines, expansion of the colleges and universities, the new arena, just like your Canada Center, uh, um, entertainment district, museums, hotels, etc. It was all going through the transformation. But before the transformation began, we, we bought it all. Here it is. Every purple dot is our building in downtown Edmonton. I think I'll give you a 
It's on our website as well, but I would like to give that to you. So one thing Main Street will be remembered for in the future is how we consolidated inner city areas in our geographic platform. That is nuts. For those listening just via audio, uh, Bob was showing us a map of, of a part of Edmonton where he's got 139 properties, 4,300 units. That is yeah. just staggering. It, it's not uh, a part of Edmonton. It's downtown called the Ice District. The Ice District. Can we? So I feel like we skipped a few steps there, because uh, at one point you said you said you had built up a portfolio. Can we talk about how you built up your portfolio uh, up to two hundred ninety? What did you say? Two hundred ninety-two units. Two hundred seventy-two units. Seventy-two. Yeah. Like I said, I was flipping homes when I was nineteen, and. Uh, right, uh, you know, right through my MBA degree, I never had a job. I've always flipped uh, real estate, and and that's not only in in Canada. That was, you know, I was uh, developing real estate in Belize and all these places. I had a love and passion for real estate, and I saw. I used to always find the inefficiencies in the marketplace, and we said, okay, this this segment is, you know, under utilize or there's less uh, buyers or you can add value to it so forth and that's how I discovered the country of Belize as well um, so uh, yeah I went through it my journey started out flipping the first two homes and went and I, and I flipped a lot so I wasn't holding uh, the 272 units like you it seems like it wasn't a holding pattern it was it was like a revolving door I was like a merchant of real estate you know I sell add value, but at one particular time I had 272 units, and that's when I did a what we call on the Alberta Stock Exchange is a JCP, and now it's called a CPC for all the wrong reasons. This is an interesting story. Um, all the wrong reasons we bought, um, we went public, and I did an IPO for one million dollars. Sounds strange, yeah, but one million dollar IPO. 272 units, and I went public. The day I went public. In the year 2000, right? Uh, uh, don't quote me on the years, but I'm going to try to keep the story at a 30,000 foot level. So the day I went, the day I went public, uh, the real estate index crashed. Uh, I don't know why it did, but it did. And then, I, then the Asian crisis happened. Um, you know, the meltdown in Asian crisis. It's probably before your time, you can probably research it. Then after, then the tech bubble in NASDAQ collapsed. Then a new phenomena happened called the REITs. Now, why that's different, why that's interesting is historically, real estate was in the ha hand of family offices, rich people, uh, entrepreneurs like me, that who, who ran the real estate. But these new guys came on the market uh, called the REITs. And what we didn't realize, and if people realized then 20 years ago, 15 years ago, that the REITs have an endless, uh, uh, what do you call, source of capital. They can continue to keep uh, going back to the market and raising. Nobody would have sold to the REITs. Everybody said, oh, you just want to give me a cash offer for $100 million? Where do I sign, right? It, it, it wasn't, you were dealing with very sophisticated uh, astute real estate entrepreneurs for the REIT market, the REIT guys who had endless sources of capital. So that turned the market inside out and it took, they started consolidating from storage places to office buildings and apartments was one of the, uh, one of the areas. So that was a unique uh, switch, which it, which it took me many years to figure out that there cannot be endless source of capital but it has been endless source of capital. So I had to create a business model which was different from the REIT. If you want to invest in the REIT market, you've got 40 odd different companies you can invest in. Um, I don't know the exact number, so just stay with me. And I, was the only, I said, I'm the only non-REIT. So if you want a dividend or a distribution, you've got these guys. If you want somebody to compound your wealth, I'm your guy. So I got zero attention for a long, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, longest time, nobody wanted to even pay attention to me. So I'm getting a little bit of attention right now with 20 years on my performance where 
put on the front page of my annual report. So here's my performance. I think the next big step for Main Street is critical mass. You know, I go from 14,200 apartment units to 20,000, then I'll become a serious player. But right now I'm still in the world of real estate, a small guy. But that gives an opportunity for um, investors uh, to get in on a, uh, on a discount basis or something that's trading below net asset value or something that trades at a higher multiple because it's a bigger company. Right. I like how, how you comment that 14,000 units is, and you're still a, just a small guy. For me and me and Dama are still in the single digits with the units that we currently own. We're, we're <laughs> very small guys. You got it. We're just compounding. We're just yeah, starting. We're compounding, working it another 20, 30 years. We'll see. And, and, and how did you go from the one million dollar that you, one million dollars that you were raising in the in the market uh, to then having fourteen thousand units? Like what? How how is how were how did you grow? I know it was over time, but how how does somebody do that? By sticking to your business model. First of all, you got to believe in what you're doing. And the math I gave you, I saw. I saw an inefficient segment in the marketplace, Western Canada, mid-market adds value. And that's my mantra. I'll keep telling you this and again and again. And 20 years later is Western Canada, mid-market add value. So you buy these buildings, you fix them up. It's a need. Like I said earlier, 73% of the population makes less than $50,000 a year. It's a bread and butter, what do you call commodity? And you, and you buy, consolidate. Now, the, how the business model has evolved is by clustering these areas, becoming a dominant player in inner city Calgary, like I showed you, uh, Edmonton map, and we have, you know, probably the biggest landlords in Surrey. Sorry, go ahead. And and sorry, and Bob, can you remind me, does does Western Canada, like I, I think in Vancouver they do, but do you have kind of rent control? What what is what is the controls? If you wanted to jack the rents up by twenty percent because you had added a significant amount of value, are you able to do that on an existing tenant or not? You can, but we never do that. Okay. So, but when you, you cannot blanket Western Canada, like Manitoba's got different ah, land yeah. currency, Alberta and Saskatchewan is uh, the land of free, and BC is on, on the empty suites. You can charge market rents. Um, but right now, we are not moving the rents up at all. Everything is uh, flatlined due, due to the pandemic. We are. Um, our customers, which first of all, we have no tenants. We only have customers and we provide a level of service in our segment that is non-existent. Our customers' health is number one and their well-being during this pandemic. Okay. Um, and I actually still have a, a number of questions, but Gary, you can go ahead if you. So, so, so yeah, Bob. For the, for the people that are listening that might not necessarily have quite a handle on sort of how things are done out west, um, a lot of our viewer base are, are obviously more so based in Ontario. Um, what is the difference in your mind between sort of, you know, investing in the western markets versus the eastern ones, specifically for multifamily? Um, let's talk about different uh, time points. Let's talk about today. Um, Alberta. Saskatchewan, well, BC is a different world, but let's say Alberta, Saskatchewan has been beaten up pretty, pretty bad in the last few years because of low oil prices. And, and we've had a growth that was accelerating from 2000 to 2014 at a pretty rapid rate. And then all of a sudden, uh, things slowed down. And so um, access to capital was tougher and so forth. And in return, our valuation came a lot lower than Ontario. So Ontario, you're trading at a very low cap rate and Western Canada, meaning Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba to a certain extent is trading at a higher cap rate. So like I said earlier, is a dollar earned in Western Canada, excluding BC, Western Canada is worth less than a dollar earned in Ontario. Then the second question some of these, some of your viewers would comment on is, well, maybe we have capital appreciation that's going to be a lot faster in Ontario than Alberta, Saskatchewan. My answer is we are, you're already trading at a much higher 
public market read multiples than our Western Canadian companies. So that's the second. And the third one is a simple finger math on price per pound. So what's the price per pound in Ontario? You take the price per pound in Calgary, Edmonton and say, okay, this is significantly low, the yields are higher, and it's almost the same product. Then you look at growth. Well, fine, capital appreciation, maybe there we won't get the capital appreciation. Now you're convinced because you've already had such a great run and nothing, trees don't grow to the moon. So you get, uh, you got to look at growth, right? Maybe Ontario growth will go to the moon and it may happen, but then you look at the Stats Canada numbers that year 2020, 2020, our population surpassed per capita Ontario's population growth. And our population the last four to five years in the recession has been compounding. So it is kind of, um, I don't understand um, why the discount is so significant from Ontario to Alberta, Saskatchewan, when our population is growing and we have lots of other things happening like the lowest corporate tax rate, um, our economy is coming back, our population is coming back. Why is it? Why is that discount? That's an answer you Bay Street guys can tell us why the discount is so significant. Um, but my hunch is the driver of Alberta, Saskatchewan and British Columbia is going to be affordability. Hmm. Nothing else. It's okay, you know, when 73% of the population makes less than $50,000 a year and you're in Ontario, you can't afford to live there. What are you going to do? Are you going to, um, you know, uh, live in, is seven of you going to live in a bachelor suite or are you going to, a, a phone call comes and your cousin's in Edmonton or Regina and Saskatoon, he says, I'm renting this beautiful suite for $930 and, I, and there's plenty of jobs. He, you know, he takes the next WestJet flight to uh, Regina, Saskatoon, Edmonton, Calgary, uh, Vernon, Penticton, Kamloops, Surrey, and so forth. Now, BC is a different uh, cost factor. It's, it's very similar to Ontario. I get this. Uh, so I'm talking Alberta, Winnipeg, Alberta, Saskatchewan. And that's why I think the growth is going to compound and accelerate. And if you believe in my thesis, my thesis is one, there's a overall supply demand anomaly. So that makes it a pretty safe asset class. But if you're looking at the top line revenue growth on just macro fundamentals, why are we, our population growing? And I think it's affordability. Nobody's ever said that on front page of these major newspapers that affordability is a key driver. Um, that, that's why our population is growing. And quality of life. Well, what's that uh, big economist uh, that you can dig up just said, uh, Calgary's got the, uh, the, it's the most, it's got the highest quality of life with the least amount of money. And there's all these reports that's coming out and there are people who are buying into it and packing up their, you know, U-Haul trader and moving here but from all over the world. Interla international immigration is a big driver as well. Quality of life, infrastructure, healthcare, and not commuting four hours a day and paying the highest taxes. So, so with that being said, Bob, as you mentioned prior in this podcast, we obviously have 1.2 million immigrants, net new immigrants that are gonna be coming into the country within the next year. Will there be enough housing? Is that the next three years? Yeah, next three years. Okay. Will there be enough housing for them? Like we're already sort of, at least here in Ontario, we suffer from a bit of a, a housing crisis where, you know, vacancies are incredibly low and obviously rent is incredibly high. So how do you create affordable housing? So the new product that you build, are we all in agreement because you both are experts? is going to cost somewhere between three to $500,000 per door. Would you? Yeah. Okay. So if you're building a brand new building, let, let's even drop the bar a little bit lower. Let's say $250,000 to $400,000 a door, which is not realistic, but let's just say that's a number. How can you rent that for a thousand dollars? 
when 73% of the people make less than $50,000 a door. Housing prices, you see, you gotta connect all the dots here. Not one dot. As at a podcast, guys, you guys gotta look brilliant if you connect all the dots. So let's connect all the dots. Demand, immigration foreign students, mm-hmm. population, supply, trades below replacement cost, affordability, Affordability is availability of product or affordability is how much money you're making. And then quality of life, right? So connect all the dots. And if you look all the dots, it seems affordable housing, that's the segment I'm in, is is an area where it's the safest asset class, right? And the growth is gonna continue. The top line revenue growth will continue. Nobody's talking about, Garrett, the point I was trying to make is nobody's talking about why we don't have supply. You can build supply tomorrow, but no developer can afford to, uh, there's no demand unless you're in this one certain segment of the population in certain geographic location. The average Canadian cannot afford to spend $2,000 a month rent. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So, and and one other note: does the uh, does the inflation kind of does the does inflation factor into your thesis at all? On absolutely, on, yeah. What happens when year over year the lumber prices go up a hundred percent? That means the replacement cost is getting going to go higher. Right. If if all the other inputs are going to continue to hire go higher in cost, the replacement cost number, which is arbitrary, we can call it whatever you want, but let's pick a number $400,000 for this conversation. Is it possible in five years, it'll be 500,000? So new replacement cost is at 500,000. So what are the, and the interest rates went up 100 basis points in the last two months. So rates go higher and replacement cost goes higher. What does the rents have to be? Higher. (laughs) <laughs> I got it. So, right. So, you know, connect all the dots. Don't connect one dot. And that's my biggest challenge with a lot of the smart real estate analysts on Bay Street. You're connecting one dot. Connect all of them. Right. So, so where do you see the, the largest opportunities then in the next, you know, I guess coming out of this pandemic? Where where are you looking? Is it is it kind of just more of the same strategy will unfold, buying that mid-market, improving it and, and, and going forward? Are you looking in certain markets specifically? Uh, where, do, where do you see the opportunity? During the pandemic, one of the things I learned that this is the most resilient and the safest asset class. Point, March collections, this March collections was 99.4% which business gives you that kind of a collection rate. So why switch lanes? Mid-market, add value, Western Canada. Why mid-market? 80% of the market is mid-market, which is a smaller building. Why Western Canada? Because there's so much wealth concentrated in Ontario that you guys are chasing the deals to two cap rates. Yeah. Add value, all the universe is 40 to 70 years old. They all need tender, loving care. One journalist quoted me on this newspaper yesterday, and please get the article. I'm a little bit like a plastic surgeon, you know, like these older buildings, we give them little, you know, makeovers. Mm -hmm. And you said, uh, even our prior chat, that you have sort of an innovative supply chain when it comes to, you know, how you do these surgical maneuvers on the older buildings to fix them up? Garrett, you're so articulate. Yeah, um, as our part of our business model on the Main Street value chain, renovation beyond the maintenance renovation, just, you know, repositioning these assets and giving them uh, to Main Street spec and improving the life of middle-class Canadian. What are we always looking for as CEOs and senior management team is how do we bring a cost down? And so one way we 
product cost down and the renovation aspect is the supply chain logistics that we've done with factory direct from Asia. So kitchen cabinets leave Asia and they come to warehouses, no middlemen, factory to warehouses. Then our contractors go put them, cabinets, laminate floors, tiles, whatever um, we need. So we got warehouses on our own land. So we don't renting space on, you know, increasing a GNA in most of our uh, most of our hubs, which is Surrey, Edmonton, Calgary, Regina, Saskatoon, and containers come and we fix these units up. So that's one of the, um, I think, innovative uh, things, the supply chain logistics, which took us 10 years to create that we've done. So we're really proud of this. Now, pandemic has slowed down our container movement and efficiencies and I don't know about my peers, but as us as Main Street, we are not as efficient as we were pre-pandemic. So, and hopefully we'll come back to that efficient cycle um, post-pandemic. Can you tell us about that renovation plan? What What is the typical Main Street renovation plan when you guys buy a building and every building's different, but you know, do you have a, a first step a first thing that you're doing, are you are you putting a Main Street coat of paint on the outside? You know, how, can you take us through that process? Yeah, what I would encourage you both to do is to go through a video library on our website because the picture is the story is better told visually than me. But I'll try to make an effort. We have a Main Street spec, and I like what I like to call myself is we are not Four Seasons, we are Holiday Inn Express. We have a standardized spec for rents less than $1,000, which is laminate floor, new bathrooms, new kitchen cabinets. And we have a certain spec that in our segment, don't forget, we are not Four Seasons, we are in the mid-market space. I think we provide the best product. Deva, have you heard of anybody that's done that sort of prefab factory to, to direct um, for, the, uh, for the value add stuff on your end? No. I think it's an uncommon, uncommon approach. Yeah, I haven't heard about that either. That's uh, it is interesting when you have yeah, a scale. I guess you can do it. One of the biggest segment, cost segment of multifamily is renovations, maintenance, and capex. So you know we saw that and we did, dissected it. And we said, okay, how do we bring costs down on every line item? Don't forget, majority of the costs are fixed costs, property tax, insurance. Utilities. You can only move the dial on utilities so much by energy efficient lights and uh, Main Street was green, green was popular and we had all these things. But the real costs, if you are in the business of repositioning these assets, the real cost was, is renovations. It's right. a big number. So how do we improve and provide a better quality of life for middle-class Canadians making less than $50,000 a year is by improving their space. What what does it typically cost on a per unit basis? Difficult question to answer because you're in so many different markets and a very efficient it, platform. There's two different segments, but let's look at the box itself. The box is a suite, the four walls. Let's assume the average square feet is uh, 700 square feet, okay? Because we have townhouses, we have concrete high rises, we have every segment. So 700 square feet is costing $6,000 per door. But that's excluding hallways, boilers, windows, roofs, exterior, but that's just the box itself. So what we try to do is, uh, our wish list is we buy buildings with great bones, and then we try to improve the boxes inside to improve the quality of living for most Canadians. And, and then we provide, and we provide ser uh, other services like security, uh, camera, 24 hour service, a resident manager, concierge service, phone call, call centers. Don't forget my competition is a fragmented mom and pops. It yeah. is not big um, luxury, um, companies who own thousands and thousands of units. Mine is uh, Joe the plumber who happens to own a 40 unit apartment building. That's my, comp that's my competition. And like having digital media, websites, services, 
maintenance, security. I don't think anybody can provide all that. And if they outsource it all, then what happens is your margins um, drop significantly. Right. Interesting. By the way, six thousand dollars per suite is so good. I mean, that is uh, that's that's really impressive. To, to and and I, and I'm I'm sure they're fantastically uh, renovated units too. So, Bob, is there is there anything that is there anything that keeps you up at night that you're that that you worry about in the industry or in some of the markets that you're in that that you say, wow, if, if this happened, then that's that's not good. It, it, it's been, what kept me up at night is this new things, new crisis that happens all the time. Like I told you, when we started out, we have the real estate index crash, the tech bubble happened, the REIT phenomena came whose cost of capital was significantly lower, interest rates go up, oil prices drop, pandemic happens. Um, Government regulations on uh, landlord tenancy act, uh, carbon tax, property taxes. Who would increase the property taxes during this pandemic? We had a property tax increase of I don't know twenty percent. Insurance goes up. I'm up. It's like every day you got crisis that you're dealing with. But you know what? If in our business, if you don't meditate every day and uh, keep sharp which I do, and that's been my secret is meditation and yoga. I I would sympathize with other CEOs who don't do it. The, you got to stay sharp because um, every every month is a different crisis. Yeah. If, it's, if it's not a macro, it's an operational crisis. And now COVID is a major crisis. How do you deal with it? How do you deal with the unknown? And COVID is an unknown. Interest rates going up 100 basis points in the last two months. Unknown. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was frightening. Um, yeah, for for me, that for me, I, I just think about the political landscape and you know whether something more extreme rent control happens in Ontario, for instance. That's that's what I'm always thinking about uh, with all these tenant advocate. Uh, groups fighting and because there's not enough affordable housing that's a, the main cause we don't we just don't have enough supply um, so that's really interesting uh, there's a famous quote by the housing minister of Vietnam he said b52 bombers did less damage than rent control in Saigon so what one of the it could be a positive or a challenge is 44% of our population is Z cohort and millennials, 44%. Most people don't have that number. And sometimes um, it's populist voting could affect the voter turnout on the 44% being rent controls and so forth. And then, then what happens? How do you solve the affordable housing issue? By building new, if you yeah. build, you need to charge higher rents right so the answer is move west young man <laughs> so that's the that's the solution move west and and, and stats canada's numbers is showing it right now i get it you guys were probably born and raised in toronto and your family their connection but think from an immigrant's perspective he lands in toronto he says oh this is great infrastructure, safe city, I can take the subway, then the reality uh, hits him pretty quickly that maybe Western Canada is a better option, or Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. Yeah, the rents the rents have been climbing so quickly too. Um, I mean, now they've slowed for a second because of the pandemic, but it's- uh, They're it, back up. Yeah, and and can I ask you this, Bob? So how how, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to take a small portfolio, a multifamily, and turn it into 14,000 units. Well, what, what's the best, you know, what steps should they be taking? Should just they be building it. their resources, you know, building relationships? Should they be, you know, just do, in, just do it. Boom. There you Boom. go. Hey, if, if you think there's a magic bullet <laughs> or a 
textbook or navigating story on success. It's not. The greatest journey is doing it. It's not. I know, you know, you guys are saying, I want to make money at any price. I can have a Ferrari and expensive wine. And the real beauty of it is the journey. Mm. Right? Real beauty. And your mentors will change every day. Yeah. The mentors you got today will be different than mentors tomorrow. And and the circum and what you've learned on taking the first step, circumstances change. Who who would have predicted a year ago there would be negative oil prices? Who would have predicted what he called uh, six months ago that the in ten years a ten year CMHC insured loan would be one point five eight percent, which I got one loan at. Who would have predicted that? So if if nobody can predict the future, why are you asking me to predict the future? But one thing I can tell you is to go out there and just do it. I tell you what separates the people who who are successful and not, they just do it. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. Do this, something. This podcast is sponsored by Nike. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we can we this uh, podcast is sponsored by two innovative guys who are creating a brand for themselves, one selling real estate, one selling mortgages, meeting egotistic CEOs who love to hear their own voice, like myself, and what do you call, uh, they get, this is my, what, eight seconds in uh, uh, stardom by Andy Warhol's famous line, this is my uh, eight minutes of stardom that you've given me in return, the knowledge you're acquiring um, by doing these podcasts and building your brand. I think yeah. it's a Brilliant idea. You guys are brilliant guys. Thank you. I like to compliment you both. Why are you asking me questions? I should be asking you. Let me tell you, nobody else in Canada is doing it. Yeah. No real estate broker and a mortgage banker is doing it. You both are. So you are pioneers. You're a trailblazer. You guys are already innovative. You've already taken your first step. Cost you nothing to what you've done to improve your brand. I'll be talking about you all day today. Oh, I love it. You're the best. Uh, can, can we can we cap can this I, off with, because I, I want to be, I know we just hit two o'clock and I'm, I'm sure you got a, a lot to do today. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Belize before we, before we go? Because I know you're passionate about that. You have a book, you have a second edition of a book about that. I tried to read a little bit of the, uh, a little bit of it before this podcast. Can you share a little bit about Belize and your history there? Sure. Um, Belize is, again, an opportunity. And let me walk you through the opportunity. Some of us like warm weather. It's right on the equator. Some of us want to want to have a second home or do business in an English speaking country where it's English speaking. The legal system is the same as Canada under the Queen's rules, where the population is not overcrowded like other parts of the world, tropical areas. Um, so population is 400,000. If you like the best beaches in the world and the best seafood and at ground zero, like most of the Caribbean is somewhat fully valued and it's expensive and Belize is at ground zero. So I, was, I look for these nuggets uh, all over the world and Belize is the perfect uh, para tropical paradise, English speaking, common law, same land title system, no capital gains tax, no foreign ownership restriction. Beautiful. Nice. Hundreds of islands, mainland. Now, if you like the jungles and if you want to go into the rainforest, or if you like the largest live reef, second largest reef, reef, but the largest live reef, fresh seafood, healthy beaches, nicest people on this planet. There's only one quite one thing I request all your viewers. Go to Amazon and buy this book, Doing Business and Retiring in Belize by Bob Dylan. Please do yourself a favor. It's an $11 investment. It may change your life. Dave, and, I, I and, and also, where else can you buy a waterfront lot? Like, don't quote me on what the, the range of prices are because they're all over the map. And I'm not promoting my real estate in Belize. I'm not. But you guys can go on the website. This is tremendous opportunities for you to buy a secondary home or small resort, a B&B, &B, a restaurant, whatever you choose to do. 
and it's a boutique environment. So if you are into the buffet lines of these mega resorts, or you want to go into a boutique environment, Belize is it. I've actually been to Belize. I did a, a one week trip there. And for the people that don't know, they also have some of the best food um, available there in contrast to the other uh, Central and South American countries. Uh, they actually have the, uh, the Amish are the ones that predominantly farm a lot of the food there, which was a very unique and interesting thing that I found when I was there that you're you're going through Belize and, you know, the traditional individuals that are there. And then there's just, you know, swaths of Amish people or might have been Mennonites, one of those two different categories. Yeah, which part of Belize did you go to? Uh, I went through, I started in the east and then I went through the whole south west of it to get to, because I went to Guatemala next. So I went through so the whole thing. You didn't go to the islands where 80% of the tourists go. I did start in the islands and then I uh, was on the east coast for a bit. And then I stayed in the center of Belize in the jungle for a couple nights. And then there's a city on the west. Uh, I honestly, I forget the names of the cities, but there's a city on the west where there's all the Inca uh, temples and stuff like that. And stayed there for probably like three or four more days before heading into Guatemala. Right. So it's, it's got the best of both worlds. It's got the islands, it's got the mainland, it's got the tropical paradise, it's got the, uh, the rainforest, it's got the Mayan mountains, 780 Mayan mountains to be exact. I have a whole chapter of my book on it. It's got opportunity, it's safe, clean, beautiful, and it's Mennonites, not Omish. So most of them have Canadian passports. They migrated a long time ago. I got a chapter on the Mennonites of Belize, which is farm to table food. That's what you're referring to. Mm -hmm. Great food. I feel I've been missing out. We'll uh, go next year, Dima. I'm I'm down. We can have the company retreat there. Uh, okay, so I, I just I think we could carry this on for for the next five hours, but um, I just want to be conscious of everybody's time here. Um, but did did you have any any further questions, uh, Gary? Nope. Or before okay. we okay. um. I think, I think, I, I feel like I we we might have discussed this already, but I'll just ask you one last question. Um, what what if you had could only give one piece of advice to you know somebody who's who's thirty years old, uh, who's a thirty year old building their career? What what would it be? Just do it. <laughs> what a, okay, what a, what a great place to end the podcast. Uh, Bob, thank you so much.